NASA has released the first science-grade images from the James Webb Space Telescope, giving us our first look at the revolutionary telescope's full capabilities. The $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope, launched in December 2021, is the world's largest and most capable space science telescope. U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled the first science-quality image captured by Webb at the White House on July 11. What you see is the 4.6 billion-year-old galaxy cluster, SMACS0723, with many more galaxies in front and behind it. Because of its massive size, the cluster magnifies and distorts background galaxies, a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. The Hubble Space Telescope captured the same portion of the universe in 1995. Compared to its predecessor, the Webb Deep Field shows more detail and only took a fraction of the time to develop. Hubble took 342 images over 10 days with a total exposure of 100 hours to capture the image. Meanwhile, the Webb took only 12 and a half hours of exposure. The observations released by the Webb team on July 12 include an image of the Carina Nebula, a star-forming region located roughly 7,600 light-years from Earth. One of Webb's main scientific goals is to study the formation of stars, and the Carina Nebula is an excellent place to do so. The Southern Ring Nebula image depicts a massive expanding sphere of gas and dust, illuminated by a dying star in the center. The Southern Ring has a diameter of nearly half a light year and is located approximately 2,000 light years from Earth. In this enormous new image, Webb reveals the Stefan's Quintet, the first compact galaxy group ever discovered. Despite being referred to as a quintet, only four of the galaxies are truly close together and caught up in a cosmic dance. The fifth and leftmost galaxy, NGC 7320, is well in the foreground compared to the other four. The image allows astronomers to study the merging and interactions between galaxies that are so crucial to all of galaxy evolution. Webb's fifth observation is the spectroscopic data of the atmosphere of WASP-96b, a hot and puffy gas giant planet orbiting a star 1,150 light-years away. Webb's detailed observation of the planet reveals the clear signature of water, along with evidence of haze and clouds that previous studies did not detect. The release of Webb's first images in spectra reveals the capabilities of all four of the telescope's state-of-the-art scientific instruments. It confirms that the observations ahead will revolutionize our understanding of the cosmos and our origins. Webb had already started the first round of science observations, called Cycle 1, based on proposals submitted before the telescope launched. Vega C, the latest iteration of the European Vega rocket, has successfully launched on its first flight. The 34.8 meters tall four-stage rocket lifted off from French Guiana on July 13, carrying seven satellites into space. Vega C is an upgraded and more powerful version of its predecessor, the Vega rocket, introduced in 2012. The upgrade brings greater performance as well as cost reductions. Vega E will be the next major upgrade to the series, which is expected to debut in 2026. Vega C comprises three solid propellant stages and an upper fourth stage powered by a reignitable liquid propellant engine. The payload fairing at the top of the vehicle is 3.3 meters in diameter and over 9 meters tall. Using a new range of payload carriers, Vega C will be able to accommodate cargo of different shapes and sizes, ranging from a single large payload up to multiple small satellites. The debut mission of Vega C displayed such diversity. The rocket lofted seven satellites on Wednesday an Italian physics satellite and six CubeSats. Italy's 295-kilogram laser relativity satellite 2, or LAIRS-2, is the primary payload, which was designed to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. The satellite is a 42 cm diameter sphere made up of nickel alloy and houses 92 cube corner retroreflectors, which are used to track the satellite via laser from stations on Earth. The purpose of the mission is to measure the frame dragging effect, which is a distortion of space-time caused by the rotation of a massive body, like Earth. Ground stations will precisely measure the satellite's orbit to understand the frame dragging effect. Its predecessor, LAIRS, was launched in 2012 on the first Vega rocket. Six CubeSats, each designed for a variety of missions, were also flown on the Vega C mission. LAIRS 2 was deployed nearly 85 minutes after liftoff into a circular orbit, with an altitude of 6,000 kilometers and an inclination of 70 degrees to the equator. All six CubeSats were deployed about 45 minutes later. Following the success of its first flight, Vega C will now enter its operational phase, with a goal of at least four launches per year. After weeks of delays, SpaceX finally launched its 25th Commercial Resupply Services mission for the International Space Station on July 15 at 12.44 a.m. UTC. The mission carried about 2,668 kilograms of science, research, crew supplies, and vehicle hardware to the orbiting laboratory. 
The CRS-25 mission was supposed to launch in early June. However, NASA and SpaceX postponed the launch after detecting high levels of hydrazine vapor in part of Dragon's Draco propulsion system. About seven and a half minutes after liftoff, rocket's first stage safely landed on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. Four and a half minutes later, the Cargo Dragon spacecraft separated from the rocket's second stage. The spacecraft is scheduled to dock with the station on July 16 at 3.20 p.m. UTC. It will stay there for about a month while the space station crew unloads the spacecraft's contents. The mission carried two external payloads in its trunk to the ISS. Among the experiments inside the trunk is a study named the Earth's Surface Mineral Dust Source Investigation, which employs NASA imaging spectroscopy technology to measure the mineral composition of dust in Earth's arid regions. This type of mapping could help us better understand the effects of mineral dust on human populations. A battery charge and discharge unit was also carried in the trunk as part of an investigation led by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The biopolymer research of in-situ capabilities experiment is housed inside the Dragon capsule and is intended to test a better concrete alternative made with organic compounds and silica. Scientists want to investigate how gravity affects the process of building astronaut habitats with on-site materials. Dynamics of the microbiome in space will investigate how microgravity affects metabolic interactions in soil microbe communities. Please check out the link in the description for a detailed overview of all the experiments on the CRS-25 mission. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX is in the midst of preparing its Starship 24 and Super Heavy Booster 7 for the inaugural orbital launch. On Monday, July 11, around 4.20 p.m. local time, a ground test of Booster 7 ended up in a fiery explosion. It wasn't immediately clear what caused the incident, but SpaceX certainly wasn't static fire testing the booster, as the company had not alerted the locals it would attempt a static fire test of Booster 7. Hours after the anomaly, Elon Musk tweeted that SpaceX was performing an engine spin start test. A spin start test typically involves using high pressure gas to spin the engine turbines for a few seconds to test the plumbing before the rest of the start sequence. At the time of Monday's test, Booster 7 was filled with cryogenic liquid methane and liquid oxygen propellant. Some of them were vented through the engines, resulting in a buildup of unburned propellant beneath the booster. As you can see in this clip from LabPadre's live stream, just before the explosion, a cloud of dense white vapor began billowing from the bottom of the booster. The fog of volatiles hung in the air briefly, filling the space beneath the launch pad in moments. Then the cloud of fog exploded, surrounding the base of the vehicle in the tower in a yellow-orange flame. The ignition source is still unknown, probably the propellant might have made contact with a flammable piece of ground equipment. The Booster 7 incident is fundamentally similar to the April 2020 Starship serial number 4 anomaly. The SN4 explosion was caused by a propellant leak from the ship's quick disconnect valve, whereas the Booster 7 propellant came from the engines themselves. Fortunately, the explosion caused no significant damage to Booster 7 or the launch pad. Starship 24, which was on the suborbital launch pad B at the time of the incident, was also unharmed. The rocket catching and stacking arm resting on the launch mount at the time of the incident felt jolts, but also appeared unharmed. However, the explosion may have caused damage to some of the ground support equipment surrounding the pad. According to Musk, the anomaly was not good, and he stated that SpaceX would not perform a spin-start test with all 33 engines simultaneously in the future. According to Reuters, the Federal Aviation Administration was in close contact with SpaceX following the explosion, but the agency would not launch a formal investigation as the incident did not occur during a formal launch campaign, and the event does not fall under the agency's jurisdiction. Immediately after the anomaly, SpaceX began slowly draining the remaining cryogenic fluids from the booster's propellant tanks. At the same time, a significant amount of fire began rising in the vicinity of the booster, sending a plume of black smoke into the air. It took hours for the smoke to clear, allowing teams to closely inspect the booster and the launch pad. After a day-long inspection, Musk tweeted that the damage appeared to be minor and they needed to inspect all of the Raptor engines. On Wednesday night, teams removed a Raptor engine from the booster and transported it to the construction site. Hours later, teams installed a brand new Raptor version 2 engine on the vehicle. Thermal protection shields of some of the Raptor engines were also removed to gain access to the engine plumbing for inspection. The next day afternoon, the tower arms gently lifted the booster from the orbital launch mount and placed it on a self-propelled modular transporter. The vehicle was later returned to the construction site to begin inspections and repairs.
Booster 7 currently resides in the Wide Bay. Musk told Reuters in an email that Booster 7 would probably return to the launch site next week, once it is verified no significant damage is found from the explosion. In addition, he stated in a tweet that if all goes well, the orbital flight test could take place as soon as next month. But if SpaceX finds any irreparable damage to the booster during the inspection, they will have to scrap Booster 7 and move on to the not-yet-finished Booster 8. This will surely delay the test flight. On Wednesday night, after Booster 7 had left the launch site, teams began the engine spin start test of Starship 24. However, the test was later aborted and propellants were vented from the ship. The next round of Ship 24 testing is set to begin as early as Monday, July 18. Everyday Astronaut recently released the last part of his video interview series with Elon Musk. Elon Musk gave Tim Dodd a detailed tour of SpaceX's Raptor 2 engine in this latest video. Let's summarize the key points discussed in the interview. According to Musk, SpaceX aims for 230 to 250 tons of thrust from Raptor version 2 engines. In comparison, the first-generation Raptor engines produce 180 to 185 tons of thrust. Furthermore, Raptor 2 has a standard operating pressure of 300 bars, whereas Raptor 1 has a chamber pressure of 250 bars. A key design change in Raptor 2 compared to Raptor 1 was the elimination of torch igniters used to ignite the air fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber. How do you, um, how's it light then? <laughs> well, that's a uh, secret sauce. <laughs> this change will reduce the engine complexity, mass, cost, and failure modes. The start sequence, according to Musk, is the most likely area for the Raptor to fail, while operating the engine is relatively simple. He added that SpaceX has blown up at least 20 to 30 Raptor version 2 engines during testing. SpaceX is also planning to replace the hydraulic gimbling system on Raptor with electric servo gimbals. Musk recently tweeted that Raptor engines currently in production use electric thrust vector control systems, saving over a ton of hydraulic mass on boosters. According to Musk, removing the engine shrouds would significantly reduce mass, cost, risk, and complexity of the system. But the only thing preventing SpaceX from removing the shrouds is the engine's heat-sensitive components. He also mentioned that Raptor is transitioning from bolted interfaces to welded interfaces to reduce fluid leak rates. During the interview, Musk stated that SpaceX always wanted to increase the chamber pressure and engine thrust and never wanted to decrease them for any reason. He added that, while specific impulse is important for an engine, what really matters is the area under the force versus time curve, which is simply the total impulse produced by the engine. Elon Musk shared much more information about Raptor engines in the interview with Tim Dodd. Don't forget to watch the full interview on Everyday Astronauts channel if you haven't already. I'll provide the link in the description. Now, let's discuss the updates from Starbase. SpaceX has recently completed minor upgrades to the Mechazilla chopsticks designed to catch and stack starships and super heavy boosters. Recently, a hydraulic actuator was removed from the tower arms and replaced with a brand new one. Later, teams tested the arms to ensure the actuator is functioning properly. The upgrade and arm test took place before Booster 7 was lifted from the launch mount. SpaceX teams recently installed weather sensors on top of the orbital launch tower to monitor the weather around the launch site. Ship 24's tile installation works are also progressing at the launch site. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.